I want to thank and acknowledge, remember, Vi and Ned Coffin, who started this series decades ago. Um, Vi and Ned lived in that beautiful colonial several story house right below uh, this building, and uh, they were dedicated to having a good civil public discussion of issues of the day and for many years carried on a, a series that was mainly on Wednesday nights in August uh, where we did economics and politics and health care and all kinds of things uh, over many years and when they died each of them uh, we tried to get uh, the community to carry on this wonderful tradition and mercifully it has endured. And in fact, uh, this morning I uh, became aware of um, the, uh, the speaker series that the United Church of Christ will do in Stratford uh, over the next several weeks, uh, starting in two weeks with Jim Antel. Antel, is that how you pronounce his name, Gus? Thank you. Uh, who's going to talk about uh, climate justice at the United Church of Christ in Stratford, and that's on Wednesday night, the 24th of uh, July at 7 p.m. And then two Wednesdays after that, Jim Wilson, who was a high school economics teacher for me uh, years ago, uh, is going to do uh, economic issues within the election circuit circus and I will assure you it will be informative and then finally uh, uh, Jameson Davis who's a recent graduate of Vermont Law School is going to do a program on individual rights and that's on Sunday uh, August 25th at 2 p.m. but there are cards in the back uh, that Cameron Smith has brought us today but this is really just a continuation of the magnificent uh, public discussion to promote civility and intelligent citizenship uh, that Vi and Ned started a long time ago. Spirited public discussion and I hope we can get to that today with these guys. Um, who is responsible for these fabulous flowers? Meg, say, say your name so we... Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Jean McDonald will have index cards for people who want to ask a question or think of a question as the uh, conversation continues. And so uh, just if you've got a question, just raise your hand and she'll pick it up. And now I'm going to ask the Lieutenant Governor candidates uh, David Zuckerman and Thomas Renner to uh, take a one minute each to suggest three adjectives about yourselves and try to build a little bit of a story about who you are around those adjectives. Why don't we start with you, Thomas? Sure. Thank you very much. I've never been asked a question like that before. Well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here today. I really appreciate that. Thank you, David, for being here as well. Um, on a beautiful day, you could be doing anything else, but you decided to come and listen to David and I, so I really appreciate that. Um, three adjectives. Young, diverse, and agile. I... I'm 35 years old, um, and one, one story that I really like to talk to folks about, about why I decided to run right now, I was talking to Senator Leahy, who's a mentor of mine from the time that I worked with him, and he asked me, how old are you, Thomas? And I said, 35. And he said, you're getting way too old. You need to run for office now. <laughs> Diverse. I'm a black gay man living in Vermont, living in America. My perspective is very different than many folks uh, that I encounter, and I think that diverse perspectives are really important and agile. Um, I'm the deputy mayor of Winooski. We are also the most diverse city in Vermont. Uh, we're also a city that does not have a very large grand list. 
i.e. translated to not a lot of money. Uh, so we have to be really agile in how we bring good policy and br good reforms uh, to our citizens. Thank you very Thank much. You. Can those of you in the back here, raise your hand if you can hear. Thank you. <clears throat> David? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, David Zuckerman, your lieutenant governor and also uh, organic farmer. Some of you had the melon out front before we got going. Uh, for three words, um, I would say driven. Uh, and a lot of that is from my mom and sort of the old Yankee work ethic. Uh, and it's played out relatively well trying to start and run a farm while also start and engage then in, in public service for 20 odd years. Um, patient in that working on some issues, whether it was cannabis reform for 20 years, marriage equality for nine years, the medical aid and dying for nine years, raising the minimum wage, uh, having patience uh, is important. And the other word that goes with that would be persistent. Um, for some, it's a pain in their neck, and for others, it's a relief that I am a persistent uh, fighter on some of these kinds of issues. Uh, for the time that I have and, and with the methodology I've used to try to uh, both succeed at farming and succeed at public policy change. Thanks. Uh, Thomas, this is a little bit unfair because I'm asking you tw two questions. <laughs> I'm asking you to start off two in a no row. No worries. Anyway, um, what do you believe the lieutenant governor's job is and why do you want it? Sure, so there's definitely the, the certain is, you preside over the Senate. Um, you are second in line to the governor. Um, but then there's what else the lieutenant governor does and, and the why I want it. And I think that the lieutenant governor's office is an amazing messaging office. It's an office that can take the work that the Senate Democrats are doing and speak as one voice and put that message out to, out to Vermont. It's also an office that can put the message out of what Vermonters believe in, what we hold dear, and where we're trying to go. And that's why I think it's so interesting, because I believe that many Vermonters are looking for a Vermont that empowers young people, embraces diversity, and we can put that message within our state and outside of our state through the Lieutenant Governor's Office, and that's why I'm interested in this office. Thanks. David, you've actually been doing the job. Is he right? And what would you add to that? <laughs> uh, I would say he is generally right. Uh, and uh, I would say that in terms of messaging and a soft, I would say it's a soft power as opposed to a hard power in that you're not voting as a legislator for 18 years. I was in committees offering language changes and so forth, but as Lieutenant Governor, you don't do that. So it is the messaging I think is a huge piece of it. Um, but presiding over the office, of, over the Senate, uh, is a critical piece around the broad issue of democracy and decorum and people's respect for the system, which I think right now is a particularly important element to talk about because we have seen such an attack on the system as a whole. And that as a messenger, I would agree, it's about helping amplify the message of, of Democrats in general. Um, on the other hand, it's also presiding over the whole body that includes Republicans, that includes progressives, as does the whole state and independents. And so being Lieutenant Governor, it's important to preside in that nonpartisan manner uh, when doing that aspect of the job, which is probably the most public facing. Uh, but then also as Lieutenant Governor, I have built a very large email list. Some of you are probably on it. And I try to put out newsletters around issues to create more public engagement with legislators, uh, sometimes supporting House bills more than Senate versions as well. Thanks. With the high stakes turmoil at the national level, the assassination attempt on, pre on former President Trump, uh, the fragility of President Biden's candidacy, for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, Biden stepped aside this afternoon and endorsed uh, Kamala Harris, the Vice President. And the stark contrast between the Democrats' rather excellent specific 80-page platform and the Republicans' 900-page um, uh, 2025 project, the L Vermont lieutenant governor isn't exactly centerpiece uh, on voters' minds. Convince us that it's important. David. Well, I think it's critically important. Vermont has uh, thankfully led the way on many critical issues around the country, and I'm 
proud to have been a part of many of those, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cannabis reform and marriage equality, medical aid and dying. Uh, I think we've led the way, well not think, I know we've led the way now on uh, child care issues and we have more to do. So Vermont can and often has, we know, led the nation uh, on many policies that have then been picked up by others. I did a lot of work on farm to school and farm to plate and we've seen diverse agriculture and local food really uh, grow in Vermont over the last 20 years. And I think moving forward, one of the things that we can do really in a way that seems impossible in other states is the issue of working in a, a broad, nonpartisan way. Uh, you know, we have that tradition, whether it's in these, you know, incredible town halls, um, whether it's welcoming all voices into the process uh, to, um, and it's okay, um, to, uh, to really bring together the ability to dialogue. Just yesterday I was at the hardware store picking up a weed whacker and it turns out the person who was fixing the weed whacker is my neighbor. He's got a Trump 2024 sign on and he said, how do you like living over on Brookside? Because we're renting a house, our house has mold in it. That's a whole other story. And uh, I said, oh, how do you know I'm there? He's like, oh, we're in that house. I said, oh, the one with the Trump banner. He said, yeah. I said, great, you know, it's been great. And isn't it wonderful that we can have a conversation across the counter in a way that I think in some places people can't and we had that conversation. I think as Lieutenant Governor, we can carry that in a way that even our governor this last year has been much more of a finger wagger at the legislature and has become more partisan, and I don't think we need to do that here. Thanks. Thomas? You know, I'm really glad that you brought up Project 2025 because it's yeah. something that I've been talking about a lot. Yeah. David and we were just at a forum together and we were both talking about it a lot. Um, Project 2025 comes after most Americans, but it directly comes after uh, people like me. It comes directly after black people. It comes directly after gay people. Uh, my marriage will be invalidated if Project 2025 happens. And the Lieutenant Governor's Office and, and all offices, a good way to fight back against Project 2025, besides electing, hopefully, Kamala Harris, is representation. Representation is key in fighting that type of bigotry and thinking. When I was first elected to city council in Winooski, my nephew, who's also black, looked at me. We were having a little celebration party, and he said, Uncle Thomas, I didn't know that people who looked like us could be elected. And I said, Isaiah, what do you mean? We have President Obama. And he said, no, in Vermont. Representation is a key part of fighting the terrible messaging and Project 2025 and the messaging of the Republican platform. Thanks. <clears throat> Vermont's failure to solve its education funding problem, where one third of school budgets were defeated by voters in towns across Vermont in 2024, one third has become a crisis. <clears throat> it's led, in my opinion, to a cynicism and a disdain <clears throat> that government works. This antipathy for government, which people like Trump exploit, affects the mood and behavior of voters up and down the ticket. This is not a fight in which the lieutenant governor has a role, but you do have a bully pulpit. What do you think about solving the school funding crisis? What's the fundamental roadblock to solving it in the State House? in a state with a stagnant aging population, declining class sizes. Challenge any of these assertions you'd like, but give us your bully pulpit advice. David? Well, this is something I've been involved with for over 20 years. I was there when we implemented Act 60, which was a landmark, another landmark law, to really say whether you're in a property wealthy community or a property poor community, every child deserves an opportunity at a good public education. And that's the foundation that we're coming from. And I think that's been a little bit lost in this conversation. The second piece that's been lost in this conversation is that as good as Act 60 was, and frankly, many schools are still open today because of Act 60. I think many would have already been closed if it had been primarily a local property tax based uh, system. We now have uh, tweaked and altered it to such an extent that it's even more complicated for people. So for solutions, I think there's a couple things. Those making over $400,000 a year typically pay a lower percentage of their in income towards the Ed Fund than the 
70% of Vermont making $128,000 or less who are income sensitized. If we made that simply income based across the board, it would be about a $30 million tax relief to those making $128,000 or less. The second piece is that unlike other states where the human services and mental health issues are dealt with through the human services part of their state budgets, under this governor and also prior, a lot of that's been shifted to the Ed Fund in order to save money and not raise taxes. But it's actually led to raising taxes, it's just that it's been property taxes. And so we need to talk about that in a very real way. It's as much as $60 million a year, if not more. That's a huge difference, and most people don't know about that. So we really have to look at where that, those two silos have been merged on a financial basis on the back of taxpayers without actually merging it on a policy basis to remove the duplicative processes that low-income families and folks with mental health challenges and so many others face in the schools where they sometimes have to go through two different sets of bureaucracy to address the issues. So I think there's um, financial shifts that can be made and there's also policy changes and they all need to be on the table. And a very quick third piece, because it is so complicated, I apologize, no, is right. that Vermont has the second highest rate of second homes in the country, about 58,000 second homes. It's about one in six residential properties in the state. And in one third of our Vermont towns, those properties pay a lower property tax for education than primary residences of Vermonters. We should absolutely be looking at making a third category, if not more, of properties and property taxes. And at least in those communities where that rate is lower for second homes, they should at least be paying the same rate as the community that they're in. Uh, and that would create quite a bit of economic relief for the fund as a whole as well. Are you an active participant, David, in that debate? Well, I've certainly spoken out a lot about it, and what I literally uh, did on Friday was send an email to my chief of staff to get the schedule of all the meetings of the new committee that was formed, and I plan to attend those meetings either to, in the meeting, offer thoughts, depending on their formats, or speak with the different uh, folks who were appointed, including, uh, you know, there were two appointments by the, by the Senate Committee on Committees, which is another part of the job uh, of the Lieutenant Governor, is to make sure uh, is to make those appointments that are assigned to the Senate on behalf of all Vermonters, whether they're citizen appointments or the committee assignments of the legislators. So, yes, in a number of different ways. Thank you. Thomas, what's your view on the roadblocks to successful reform of school funding? Yeah, so David, thank you for doing an explainer on, on where we are right now. It's a lot. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of this ties back to what I've been talking to Vermonters about as I'm traveling is housing. Um, a lot of it comes back to housing. We, as you mentioned, we have an aging population. We need to attract people to move to Vermont, and we need to make it possible for young Vermonters to stay here. And a large part of that is we need to build more housing. And in that way, one, we can increase the students that are actually in the school system, but there will be a larger base of folks that those property taxes can be pulled from. We also need to look at new methods of funding uh, our schools. And David, you mentioned some. I've heard some folks talking about a portion of income tax going towards uh, school funding in order to diversify that tax base. What we know is uh, we all want our students to do well and to perform um, hopefully better than any other student across the United States. And that cost, costs a lot of money. When I speak to Vermonters, they're not upset that they're spending money on students. It's that they feel like they're spending a lot of money and the, res the students aren't getting the best results. They're losing music classes. They're using Sp losing Spanish classes. But folks aren't upset about spending the money. So we just need to find ways to increase that tax base and also to diversify the taxes that are going towards schools a little bit. Thanks. Thomas, how satisfied or unhappy are you with the job Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman is doing? <laughs> you know, um, I'm running for a reason, but um, you know, David, I think we have ran into each other as I worked for Senator Leahy, as I worked for Congresswoman Ballant. Um, by no, no means do I consider David someone I wouldn't say is a friend. Um, what I think is that we need um, new leadership in Montpelier, leadership that represents uh, who Vermonters are and what their experiences are. Um, and as well as um, Vermonters talk a lot about embracing our young leaders, about embracing diversity and hoping for diversity in our state government and um, that we don't have that. 
we don't have that at all, and it's very important for us to start moving towards um, some younger and more diverse leaders. Thanks. David, how do you feel about being challenged by a candidate who claims to have the endorsement of every member of the Burlington City Council? You want to correct that slightly? I yeah, it's the, the Democrats on the Burlington City Council. I, but they're the majority. <laughs> well, uh, I have the majority of the legislators from Burlington, so we can get into that sort of um, conversation. But no, I, I think it's important to have uh, democracy work. And democracy means presenting choices and options. Uh, I believe it's the only statewide, I'm the only statewide incumbent with a challenger uh, in a primary. And on the one hand, I go, oh, I wish I had a little more time on my farm and a little more time with my family. You know, there's no doubt there's the personal side. But I think our system is actually fundamentally quite flawed right now. Most people don't have enough choices. We obviously just got the very big news of President Biden's decision. But as a whole, I think months and months ago, long before the debate, some folks thought these are the two choices. And as much as I really appreciate Biden's amazing work, and would love to have had him there another term if that had been the, the way we were gonna go. Our system doesn't provide as many options for either candidates to run or uh, choices for voters to pick from. So having a choice, at least a choice of two, is a lot healthier for a democracy than a choice of one. So is it personally frustrating for life? <laughs> sure, but is it important for democracy? Absolutely. You two are both very gracious. Thank you. <laughs> um, I like his shirt, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where I got it. <laughs> David, identify a public policy success that you've had and what you learned from it. I'm going to ask about failure also. Mm. Well, when I was working on genetic engineering food labeling, which was a bill and topic I worked on for many years, I actually put a piece in the bill after many years to say, let's only implement the law when we raise an independently funded legal defense fund. Because a lot of people were not interested in passing the law because Vermont was going to be sued. We've heard this with the big oil pay bill. You've heard it over and over with different policies we've done. And I thought that would bring along some folks who were maybe a little bit more conservative about the financing of the state. And it turns out that right before we had the committee vote in the Senate Agriculture Committee, and I had two yeses, two noes, and one undecided, I was speaking with the undecided person, and he said, you know, I really do want to support this bill. But this provision that creates this, this fund is a problem for me, because if we set a precedent that to pass bold laws, you have to get private outside resources to create a defense fund, that's going to create some disparities on what laws may end up, end up having possibilities from those with resources, which I thought was actually a very good point, and I'd heard about it a few times, and I said, so if we take that out, would you vote for it? And he said, yes. And so something that I put in a bill to try to maybe broaden its appeal turned out to be the piece I took out to then get the third vote, which set the wheels moving to implement that law. Sadly, it was then, while a tremendous success and companies were changing their labels and everything was working well, it then became a failure because in Washington, they superseded our law and killed genetic engineering labeling on food. So it was both a success in, a, in learning different strategies and how every bill is different in terms of how you gain some votes and get people on board, and then sadly, it was also a failure. Great example. <clears throat> Thomas, a success, a public policy success in what you learned. Yeah, so if any of you have been to Winooski recently, you've seen that it has changed quite a bit. We've heavily invested and changed our rules about housing uh, so that we can increase our housing and increase space for small businesses. But what I'd like to talk about, because that happened before my time and I've continued to perpetuate it, is most recently, and I think relevant, is our most recent budget session uh, where we were debating everything from road spending to how much we can afford to spend for librarians. And as I was traveling across the, the city, which is quite easy, it's just one square mile, uh, I was talking to people and, and one conversation with one group of women really stood out to me. I met with a group of ladies who get together once a month, the youngest one is 82, and they were talking to me about the property tax increase that was proposed by the city at that point was about 18%. They had done the math and it was gonna be, it was gonna be more money than they had left over at the end of their social security checks. I had been feeling that people were feeling 
their pocketbooks really tightening. I've been talking about that on council, but once I heard this, I went back to our council and we have two members of, the, two members of council who are progressives, one's an independent and there's two Democrats. No Republicans, but we're still bringing people together. People were dead, there were, folks were dead set on going really, really low or staying at that 15%. And what I worked on really hard for several months is bringing people to the middle, to somewhere where we could have a property tax increase that would provide services. We'd have to delay some stuff, but it wouldn't be the financial pinch that we were originally looking at. And I'm really glad that I did that now, and I'm glad that I had some very tough conversations with my colleagues um, because the school taxes that folks are receiving right now in their bills have doubled or tripled some folks' property tax in Winooski. So if I hadn't done that fight, they would be seeing a double whammy on both sides of the tax bill. So I'm very, very proud of that work that I did. Thank you. Sherry, are we, uh, has there been an uh, Esther sighting? Yes, <laughs> Esther's oh, in the good. back. All right. <laughs> Thank you, I didn't know whether we, <laughs> whether we were on schedule and so on. So this is from a conversation with uh, David Leonhardt in today's New York Times. Mm. If the Democratic Party wants to win back some of those working class voters and voters of color that they've lost, it probably needs to be more introspective about how it has become increasingly affluent or the party has become increasingly affluent. <clears throat> that turns off many working class people. Too often Dems suggest that anyone who doesn't vote for them is being irrational or ignorant. What do you think about Leonhardt's assertion? David? I, I think he's spot on. I, I was uh, raised in, outside of Boston for 10 months of the year and in a very rural county in Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, very close to West Virginia. The two areas couldn't be more different. In Virginia, that county voted 85% for Trump, and in Brookline, Massachusetts, it was 85% for Biden. And when I think about the families I knew in Virginia, uh, folks that loved their families, they wanted to work hard, raise a family, find a piece of property, build a home. Um, in that county in the 70s, out of 13,000 people, there were 2,500 jobs in manufacturing plants that you could get out of high school. Those jobs are all gone. And the energy that's behind Trump, the energy that we see in the sort of broad red geographical part of this country is a very real energy about sort of economic neutering. And people are fearful about their future. They don't have hope for their future. And I think it's an issue that, that is across the demographics, because you mentioned a couple demographics there. Um, and so while I think a lot of discussion about uh, diversity and demographics of diversity is critically important because we still have huge disparities, particularly of wealth, through centuries of policies that have created that disparity. Um, if we talk about the fundamentals, and Thomas talked about housing and affordable housing earlier, if you talk about the fundamentals of the economic disparity in this country, ever since Reaganomics, where we've continued to bifurcate our society, we are now at the most split economics since the raging 20s, right before the 30s. Mm. And um, the haves are doing really well, but the majority don't have that. And I think if we don't focus towards that, and Bernie's been a huge inspiration for me, and if you watch him speak, that is the drum that he's been beating for a long time, um, then I think we really do have a, a, a real risk of losing in November at the presidential level. We have a risk of losing more seats in Congress um, because sometimes our message is too complicated. Our message is uh, too erudite, to use a complicated word, and, um, and uh, we've got to get back to the fundamentals of, of basic economics for working people. And if we do that again, our side of the political spectrum could, could run the table for decades, but I think we've lost a little bit of that. Thomas? Yeah, I mean, I agree. <laughs> um, you know, I think about the town that my father's from. It's a very small town in rural Maine, and they were one of those towns that was deep blue, always voted for Democrats, and then when Trump came on the scene, they heard somebody, whether we like it or not, was talking to rural America, talking to people whose jobs mean they get their hands dirty, 
and the Democrats had abandoned that message a very long time ago. When I talk to my cousins who all have MAGA hats and um, are very excited to vote for Trump again, the issues that they care about and the policies they actually believe in are democratic policies. We just haven't reached them with our messaging. They, they hear the Trump message and they hear somebody who says he cares about them. And we, many of us know that's not true, but he says it and we haven't been saying it. If we want to succeed as Democrats, we need to go to those places and talk to those people. You know, I remember when I was working um, on Hillary Clinton's campaign here in Vermont, but we were talking about places where we should knock doors and we talked about some small towns in the Northeast Kingdom and we were told, oh, well, don't go there, don't talk to those people. We need to talk to those people in order to engage them, in order to bring them back. The Democratic platform is amazing. We believe in amazing things and most Americans believe in what we do. We just need to talk to those people and let them feel heard, let them know that we care and continue to reach out as much as we can. Thanks. I have a gorgeous array of a hundred more questions, <laughs> which you guys fortunately are off the hook about because <laughs> <coughs> time's up. Um, I just wanted to comment, David, I found your, uh, the newsletters on your website particularly informative. Uh, I read through the reasons why Governor Scott uh, rejected the eight or nine bills that, uh, that the legislature then ended up having to override the vetoes on, and I found them succinct and um, really informative. And Thomas, I found the endorsements on your website uh, particularly helpful in giving you, a, uh, giving me a sense of authenticity about you and um, a sincerity that was uh, really good. So, do you have closing remarks that you'd like to take 30 seconds each to make? On how sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, the other thing I would add to the last question was that as a farmer, I do get out there and shake hands with some of those other rough hands, and I've often had people say, oh, you're different. I mean, and the reason I tell that message is that it's not so much as well that we're not messaging well, but sometimes it's uh, a lot of folks vote on how they feel more than what they hear. Um, so when people feel my handshake, it makes a difference. And I, I'm not telling you that that's the way it should be, but that's the way it often is. And when Bernie writes, it's okay to be angry. I think that's part of it as well. And so I think we have the right message and sometimes, and I think probably both of us are too gentle in some ways, at, at like really hammering home with the energy of the fear that people feel. Um, but I would also just close by saying, at this next session, 15 of the 30 senators will be first term or second term senators. And as the presiding officer who maintains the tone of the room based on who I call on next or after a floor session explaining something that happened to one of the newer senators, which happened many times last year around maybe how you do an interrogation differently uh, in terms of keeping the, the tone, get your points across, but don't attack the intent of the other person. Um, that bringing that experience right now in this moment to the Senate with the number of new people, I think is, is really important for the democracy part, which is the foundation of every other issue that we work on. Cool, thank you. Thomas? Well, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate that. And as I've been running for lieutenant governor, I've had the privilege of traveling those towns and speaking with people across Vermont. I've done a lot of work in Winooski, some work that I think we can replicate across the state in terms of affordable housing, in terms of small business growth. And I think that we're at a time in Vermont where we're ready for Montpelier to have folks who are regular Vermonters who understand what you're all dealing with and who have had their ears to the municipal ground, understanding the problems that you have at your kitchen table. And that's what I bring um, in my candidacy for Lieutenant Governor. I'm very excited to continue to work with my uh, friends in the legislature, work with hopefully Esther Charleston if she is elected governor. Um, and thank you again so much for being here. Uh, ThomasRiverMont.com is where you can learn a little more. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions after as well. Great, thank you very much.
All set? Oh, yes. We have the pleasure of welcoming Esther Charleston to uh, Stratford, Vermont. Esther, if you would uh, kindly introduce yourself to us. Uh, if CNN were to do a mini documentary on you, how would you like to be portrayed? What story would you like to see presented? Go ahead. I first want to say thank you for having me. Honored to be here, and it's good to see everyone. <clears throat> if CNN, hmm, the first thing that comes to mind for me is my Haitian parents. They are immigrants from Haiti and came to the U.S. and created an incredible life for their five children where we are thriving, believing in dreams, and um, believing in the America they came here for. I am a mother to two beautiful souls, nine and six, have a wonderful husband, so being a parent is a huge part of who I am. I am a community leader and a public servant, and that is what I would love for folks to highlight. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you could be the dictator Trump says he'd like to be on day one, what problem would you pick to solve, and how would you solve it? Listen, I would cancel all student loans. That's the first thing I would do. Um, Find a, okay, I'm processing this as I'm talking to all of you. Right now, we're just in a time where it's so divisive and so, so heart-wrenching, actually, where families are not talking to each other, really. Um, and then, as we learned with the news of Biden stepping down and folks being nervous, so if I were to be the dictator, which I never want to be, by the way, um, I would want people to come together and really have facilitate hard conversations and creating a team to do that where we're at the kitchen table breaking bread together but coming together and remembering that we are a melting pot here in America. We're not, we're all in this together. So that would be an initiative that would, um, that would be important to me. Wonderful answer. Uh, so it, interestingly, it feeds right into the next thing that was on my mind. If you invited Governor Scott to your home mm. and he came, what would you talk with him about? How do you think the conversation would go? I don't know if he would accept my invitation, but I would extend it anyway. I would start with family values. I would start with talking about parent, being parents. And, um, and I would love to hear about him, his childhood and how he grew up and why he loves Vermont. I would focus on what we have in common, mm -hmm. which is a love for Vermont, because hey, we're here, we want to serve. And um, so that's where I would start. Cool. What are your core values? My core values include honesty, transparency, community, definitely. And people, seeing people, I should say, all. Great. <clears throat> Under our climate change regime of torrential downpours, mm. regularly causing devastating flooding, how do you think Governor Scott is handling this recurrent, heartbreaking, brutal emergency? What would you do?
would first talk about climate change. I think Governor Scott doesn't <laughs> make the correlation. It's like, oh, this happened to happen. And it's like, no, the signs are there, it's getting worse, and it's gonna continue to happen. So acknowledging that piece. And, and what would I do differently? Is that what? That's yeah. Okay. Well, I would get my hands dirty. I would volunteer. A few weeks ago, I was in Barrie, and we were canvassing, asking people what they needed and wanted. And so I would definitely be in the communities, not just taking pictures of them. Thanks. <clears throat> Racism is still rampant in America. As a member of an ident identifiable minority group in Vermont, what's been your experience with racism? Well, <laughs> um, okay, so I would say there's several layers to this, right? My own journey. So, um, Haitian parents who are like, hey, we came to this country. So you can go to school, get a job, and pay your bills. Mind your business, right? Don't focus on uh, anything else. And so it was a journey for me to get to a place where I knew racism was real and it was affecting me. There was a time where I ignored it, quote unquote, or wasn't honest with myself. And it wasn't until I had children and was aware of how they were treated that it really came to my awareness. And so a black woman living in a predominantly white space, I deal with it all the time. It's part of my norm. And I choose to believe folks don't know better. And I call in and call out when necessary. But yes, it's still alive and present. Thanks for your candor. <clears throat> Democrats, more so than Republicans, are feeling the stress and anxiety about the existential election that we're confronting on November 5th this year. Yeah. Um, you have an antidote for that anxiety? Ooh, let me tell you, I think if I had the answer to that, I'd, I'd be a millionaire. Um, no, what I would say is focusing on what we can control, what's going on in our state. Um, voting, <laughs> very important, but also investing in young people who are interested in, because whatever happens <laughs> November 5th, I mean, we still have a long road ahead of us. And um, investing in young people who want to engage, creating opportunities for them, so, um, I believe young people are our answer. How are we investing in them and seeing them and pushing them forward so that there's a better tomorrow because right now it's looking grim. And it won't stay that way. <laughs> I don't think, <clears throat> I hope. It's daunting to challenge a four term popular, popular in quotes, Mm -hmm. uh, incumbent governor. What is your plan to win this election? I want a name. It's daunting. It depends who you're talking to. I am a black woman who's had to overcome obstacles all my life. I've always been limited, whether it be in school, jobs, always had to prove myself or go beyond. So, Daunting, yes, but it's also, for me, okay, another obstacle. What is my plan? Is that the question? What, what's my plan? Is that yes, the question? that's right. My plan is to be my authentic self through this time. My plan is to reach out to the Democrats who are lukewarm, <laughs> who are on the fringes, and get my message out there. Thank you. What would you like to know from this group of uh, citizen voters here? 
Is there a question that you can ask them that they could give you additional information? Yes. I would want to know what do you think the answer is with the November elections looming? Where do you, th do you think it's hopeless? And if not, if so, I'm sorry, <laughs> but if not, I would love to hear hope. What is your hope? How nice. Would you close us out here with a message of hope or inspiration? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Though it may seem daunting, and it is, our country has gone through worse and has overcome. Though it seems like we're taking 10 steps backwards <laughs> and maybe a step or two forward, I believe as a country we can make it through this hump. It's gonna require us to come together in a way that we're not used to and we can do it. Honestly, I think about my ancestors. I'm Haitian, the Haitian Revolution, the people that I come from seems impossible. Haiti right now is struggling, we will admit, but we could talk about that later. But will I, what I will say is when I see my family coming here and creating incredible lives because of the opportunity that America affords them, for my children and your children and you, your lives that you are able to lead here, I believe there is hope. But we have to be in it for the long haul. And the answer we may not see in our lifetime, but working towards it is worth it. Thank you. How inspiring. Thank you. Does anyone have a question from the audience? Who do you think should replace Joe Biden for the, for the That's a great question, actually. I was just talking to my husband in the car. Uh, ooh. Michelle Obama. Next. No. <laughs> no, honestly, Michelle Obama. <laughs> I don't think she'll take it, but uh, we can all wish and dream and hope. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I thought about that too. And I also, okay, good question. I know, I know, I thought about that too. Um, oh, us, us getting behind Kamala Harris. I thought about that too. And I also understand Kamala is a black woman. And my lived experience tells me <laughs> um, uh, in a short amount of time, I, it would be ideal, honestly, personally for me. And it would be hard to swing, I do. I do believe because a black woman in leadership, I'll give you an example, um, there has never been a black woman governor in the United States history. Stacey Abrams would have been the first one. And she was the first to get a nomination. So if all goes well with the primary, I'll be the second ever. So that perspective tells me, is America ready for a black woman to be president? 
We haven't even, we, we're not even governor yet. I mean, we did have VP, she, she was VP, but, um, but it would be a, a tough swing. In, in, and I'll give you another, I am running for governor and the, again, yes, there's my, you, people have very different questions. You are not a Vermonter. You are young, you have young children. You know, the list goes on and on of the limitations that I, I receive. And some of the limitation is who do you think you are? As a black woman coming here, who do you think you are? And so knowing that is my lived experience and I still choose to show up anyway. Because I'm thinking about the future. Whether I make it or not, it's more than just uh, winning, but we have to move forward. And I see me being here and running as a time for Vermont to self-reflect, especially during this time, this divisive time. We've been progressive in so many ways and the first to do so many things, a leader to other states we can be here too. And so, yes, it would be a dream for Kamala, and I pause, because I know what it would mean. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Yes. Oh, yes. I would say, and the way I would phrase it is attainable housing. So housing on all levels, right? From affordable to, to those who can afford <laughs> more. One of the ways, so I was on the select board in Middlebury and the zoning, um, we struggled with getting people to believe that to wanna build new buildings, right? New things in our backyard, or people deemed it as affordable housing. We don't want that, not in our backyard. And so working with select boards around zoning policies to make sure that we can grow in that way, we have a lot of old buildings that aren't up to code and need to be, and so I would commit to making sure that we, to support projects that move housing forward, um, I'll be honest, right now I am looking for a rental. My mom owns two houses and what we're paying for rent now, she's like, my mortgage and my taxes don't add up to that. It's so hard, so living it and being there and seeing it, I had two house rentals where um, the owners decided to sell the house. And I don't blame them. You know, they sold one house for $590. i am not there yet. The other house was for $400,000. Not there yet either. And so understanding where that comes from and supporting initiatives to make sure that we have enough. And that includes zoning. Last question. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's a huge issue, and a lot of folks are feeling it. One, I would say um, restructuring the way we pay for education and not putting the burden on homeowners would be definitely a huge priority. And so creating, um, finding different, different options to fund it, supporting students, supporting homeowners, and honestly, one of the ways I was thinking about doing it, it might not be popular, but I'm gonna say it anyway, I'm up here, um, is you know we have the 1% of Vermonters who have an abundance of wealth. And some who, I'll be honest, who are willing to share that wealth. On um, March 19th, there was a group of wealthy Vermonters who were like, hey, legislators, tax me. Please tax me because I want, I want everybody to thrive here. So tapping into that, so that um, just the myth that everybody's gonna flee, those who have money, I'm finding it's not quite true. So tapping into that resource would be a great way to help fund education. Let's give candidate Charleston one more. Everybody all set? I, I've just been asked to remind people in the audience that the primary is Tuesday, three weeks from now, uh, August 13th. So please uh, do your civic duty and vote. There are not huge numbers of contests on the ballot, but there are some significant ones. You just saw one for Lieutenant Governor, and anyway, please vote. I'm going to ask, uh, because we've got so many great uh, legislators from Orange County. Back in the old days, it used to be a totally red county. And now, uh, we have seven, um, seven Dems and two Republicans uh, associated with this county. Some of them are overlapping counties with Washington and Addison and Caledonia and so on, so that it's not all just pure Orange County towns, uh, however. So I'm going to ask you three questions, and I'm going to give each of you just a minute to respond. You're going to have to be really creative and succinct. We're going to reward brevity over bloviation. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and the, the first question is, especially for you multi-term legislators. Now, I know the pay is fabulous. And I know the ego boost that you get every day when you go to the gas station and grocery store from your applauding constituents. I know that those are almost irrefutable. They're, they're, the, the, it's, the, uh, it is so addictive that I, I can easily understand why you'd never want to give up this job. But I want to know what really excites you about running for the State House again this year. Show us your enthusiasm, particularly you multi-term incumbents. Thank you. Let's start with you, John. John O'Brien on the scent. And where do you represent first, and what excites you? Thanks. Um, I'm John O'Brien. I represent Tunbridge and Royalton, so one town in Orange County, one in Windsor County, just over the hill. Um, it's great to see you all. I know a lot of you, um, and without bloviating, I just love coming to this building. Um, the one funny story I thought of is my sister got married here. I went to Newton School, so I spent a lot of time here at town meetings and plays and things like that. Gave a commencement address at Newton School, but uh, my sister got married here, and she married somebody called Phil Scott, a Quaker from Philadelphia. <laughs> um, what excites me, uh, I, I think all of us, we're all multi-term here, um, legislators. What excites me is the long, in, in some ways, the longer you stay in Montpelier, if you don't get burnt out, um, you understand how things work in the state house. And it's, there's a process there with committees, with, with interrogations, with how bills move. And it takes a long time to figure that out. Some people 
on this, in this row here, figured that out a lot sooner maybe than I did, but um, it helps a lot. If you have legislation you want to get through, the, the most effective people there, probably one of the most effective is Alice Emmons from Springfield, Vermont, who's the dean of the house. She's been there since the 80s. She gets a lot done because she's been there so long. So that's why I'd like to go back. Thank you. Rebecca, let's go to you. I knew you were coming back. You kept <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> well, um, of course I'm running because I represent the best of all the districts along with Jim Haslam. So. <laughs> um, you know, it's been an I've been in and around Vermont and Montpelier, and I'm running because I think Vermont is at an inflection point, and I think several people spoke to it today, and I think it's really about the tragedy of the commons and how we're going to resolve it. How are we going to resist autocracy? How are we going to work together? Because the challenges we have, whether it's climate resilience, health care, this education funding, and obviously I know something about that because I was Secretary of Ed, it's, these are hard problems, and this is an incredibly important time to be doing that hard work and sort of negotiating those hard problems. And one of the things I love about my colleagues at this table is none of us are running for the big bucks. I sit on the Appropriations Committee. I saw that our total salary is about the same as what Jason Gibbs, the Chief of Staff for the Governor, gotten an increase in one year. So we're not here for that. We're here because we care about Vermont, we care about our communities, and we also believe we can make a difference. You do not show up to the legislature year after year if you don't believe in the state and you don't believe we can make it better for our neighbors. So that's why I'm excited to run. That's a great answer. Thanks. Jay Hooper. So I'm going to recycle a line from the last time we did. I was at one of these. Um, my name is Jay Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. And believe it or not, I'm running for my fifth term, and I still look 19. <laughs> so uh, it's one of the reasons, actually, that um, sometimes in the state house people have a hard time listening to me because you know ageism exists in both directions, as we can see on the national uh, stage. But the the truth is that this winter I had a pretty tough um, dealing with, with burnout, what John was just describing. And uh, it had me kind of considering whether or not I'm ready to move on. Um, but I realized that the thing that is most enjoyable about this job is, in fact, the campaign. So I decided that I would be foolish to hang, my, hang up my hat uh, right before the most exciting part of the job, which is to go campaigning. And the, the pandemic deprived us candidates of that um, privilege uh, for, a, for a long time. And so I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do another campaign. And if it, if it turns out that nothing has changed in Montpelier in terms of political culture and human behavior, then it's possible I would, I would you know, decide to do something else sooner than, than a, a two-year term. But I intend to, to, to run for a fifth term and get elected and, and do those two years. Thanks. Jim. Yes, sir. Um, I see I'm the only one with a only one with a tie here. I put it on when I got out of my car, and I guess I'll keep it on. Um, Jim Maslin with Rebecca Thefford, Sharon Stafford in Norwich. Um, I've been in the legislature for 26 years now. Um, it's not the same. No two years are the same. They're all different, or no one year. You know, they're all different. Um, what would I do differently, or what am I interested in doing? Um, other several people today have and we'll talk about the, um, the underlying very strong disagreements among many of them on how we're going to solve problems. Some of our colleagues say, some of the people in your neighborhood say, well, you guys have a super majority, you can do anything you want. <laughs> ha ha. Um, there are 150, 150 members in the House, many of them are Democrats, and it turns out that we seldom agree on everything or anything when it gets right down to how we're going to craft legislation and, and pass it. And one of my frustrations is with this notion that, that we're all Democrats and we can do everything we want and that we can spend as much as we want and people will pass it and everything will be wonderful. But in fact, um, we have, as you all know, severe limitations with financing in this state. There are a lot of things that are very, very difficult to fund that are worthwhile, and we end up, this is what I, my point is, we end up amongst ourselves um, squabbling, for lack of a better word, about how we're going to spend things, how we're going to raise money, and how we're going to spend it on, and 
our methodology, how we go about this stuff, is not very effective. It may look on the outside that we get our work done, we pass some pretty big bills. Some of them are very big, very important, and we're glad that we get them done. Um, but those of us who've been here a long time, as people in this table know, is we need to work on our process amongst ourselves so that we can get better bills passed um, sooner in the legislative session without fighting about them. Um, and we do that all the time. And this, I'm a little off track maybe from what you expected me to say, um, but my interest in going back is to develop a better process which is more effective than what we pass. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Carl Demro. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carl Demro. I represent the Orange One District, which is the towns of Corinth, Orange, Vershire, and Washington. Um, what excites me? So this next uh, biennium is going to see a, uh, a redesign of the way we deliver and fund education in the state. And that is something that I'm excited about being a part of. And I've got four um, goals that I would like the state to, like the legislature to attain in that process. We need to have a system that's fair to students and gives them the best possible education that we can afford to give them. The new system, the funding system needs to be affordable for taxpayers. It needs to be understandable for taxpayers. And the last part, and this is particularly important for my district, the gains that were made for rural districts and districts that have a lot of students in poverty in them uh, through Act 127 need to stay in place. That was a uh, a piece of legislation that really leveled the playing field statewide for um, education in poor communities and rural communities and communities with a lot of uh, kids who are learning English uh, for the first time. And so those are my four baselines. Fair to students and good for students, affordable, understandable, and maintain the, uh, the, the gains made in Act 127. So I'm, I'm excited to go back to Montpelier and work uh, on that come January. Very tidy, thank you. Monique Pri Priestley. Thanks, uh, Monique Priestley, Orange 2, Bradford Fairley, West Fairley. Um, as somebody who in, has a community center that I started um, and is uh, very much just a connector, uh, my favorite part of the job and the thing I'm most excited about is uh, I spent a lot of time just responding to like constituent emails. And in a lot of cases, um, not every case, but you tend to hear more from people who are upset than are not, um, that are excited. So. Um, you know, I would get really long emails, uh, just, and it would be anything from like, it would be in some, in often cases, like somebody's whole life story, and it would just be, they needed to vent, they needed to get it out, and every single time I would respond, and I would engage, and I would explain, you know, little pieces that I could, um, but then I would say like, let's have a cup of coffee, um, and every single time the response was, wow, I did not imagine you would actually respond to me, let alone actually engage with me in a meaningful way. Um, so that's, that's why I'm there. Um, I love bringing people into the state house. I love when I'm in the building having conversations and I, I took on one of the biggest bills in the building this year, data privacy, um, and it meant that I had a lot of convers really tough conversations uh, with all of the lobbyists and all of their clients, uh, as well as trying to educate and inform uh, fellow legislators and the public. And, you know, this summer, spending a big amount of time also just trying to do um, small business and just public engagement on the importance of data privacy and artificial intelligence and everything that's crushing us and scamming us and taking away our money and uh, really putting people at risk. Um, and so I'm excited to return to continue to work on that. Thanks. Senator Mark. Thanks. The thing that I found most daunting that earlier in the speaking is that um, 15 of the new senator, 15 senators are going to be first or second termers. Um, and I'm an old geezer. I've been around for a while. Some of my contemporaries died or resigned in the last three, four months. Um, Carl gave us a list of four things that we ought to be paying attention to. Um, and we ought to design towards. But I'm going to go to uh, 
a statement that I've heard over and over again, we're all in this together. We hear it all the time. And I've, my response has always been, of course, we're all in this together. Our challenge is to come out of this together. Coming out is the test, not being thrown in together. And if there was anything I heard in the Lieutenant Governor's debate, it was the income equality issue, which since I have served in the legislature has become more and more unequal. And when we look at being in this together, um, the inequality, when, you know, some people are, are in it over their heads the minute we get thrown in it together. And when they come out, they're, they're not over their heads, they're at the bottom. And we do not take that into account because we, we take that we're all in this together as if it were true. But each year that passes and each crisis we deal with, we become less in it together. And um, the ex-president who's running for re-election knows how to play that. And he provides solutions that sound enticing. Um, we, we have work to do. We have a governor that I think we all like. He's a nice, a nice fellow. Um, I've never heard him say a harsh word. This year he played some pretty strong politics. Um, majority is supposed to rule, but supermajority is somehow an evil thing. He vetoed a lot of stuff, and we overrode most of it. The one bill we didn't override was the one that Monique was the sponsor of. And in my opinion, it's the bill that Vermonters would overwhelmingly say, do it. Your data your, is private. Who do they think they are that they can take that stuff and sell it to other people? If the reason that, that bill didn't pass, it's because bills usually take two sessions to pass. And by golly, you gave it a, a, a bump. <laughs> and it's going to happen next year. Um, Thank you. Income in inequality is is getting worse and it, under, it undermines everything Democrats and Republicans try to do together. Thank you. To be clear, that bill did pass, just got vetoed, and then we didn't override, that's all. So good job, Monique. She's really the MVP up here, I'll tell you. Yeah, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Rebecca, help us out here. With the political divide across America becoming a chasm, how will you, while you're campaigning, bridge the gap to promote civility, tolerance for differences, respect for neighbors who have, in some cases, very different political opinions? And how will you ensure and safeguard comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y, in the State House when you're reelected? This is a 30-second answer. I know, you spoiled me, because I was going to do them all three together, because then I could get it in. <laughs> no. um, I had a conversation with a friend about the recent flooding, and she pointed out that when you think of the flooding and the damage, we've got communities that have been hit for the third time. Um, communities are trying to dredge their rivers now to deal with that. But when you dredge a river, you actually create worse flooding down the road. When you think about the fact we couldn't afford to keep people in homeless hotel, or in hotels if they were houseless for $120 a night, so instead we're going to unhouse them and spend $3,000 a night in an emergency room because people need to be safe. When you think about the fact that we can't afford to fix black mold in our public schools in some of our communities or stop the sewage that's blocking it, backing in, but we can afford to send dollars, your public tax dollars, out of state to exclusive prep schools that would reject 99% of Vermonters, and we fund 
private schools in Vermont that refuse to comply with our non-discrimination statutes, who openly teach that homophobia is okay. When we do this as a state, we are not saying we're in this together. And again, what I appreciate about these colleagues is we are going back, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the environment, whether it's our economy, we are going back to make sure that we are doing this together. It's fear. People want to know that we're looking out for them, and we can't minimize the fear. It's real. People are very worried about being able to pay their bills, get the health care they need. And what we can do to ensure comedy is make sure they feel heard and to work together to make sure that they feel safe and they know we're there for them as well. Great that's answer. what communities are, and that's how we're going to get through this together. Thank you. John, you got anything to add to that, please? <laughs> Um, just w one one thing. Um, I uh, interesting looking at the Orange County Democratic Committee um, sponsoring this, and I, I what I find, and Jim alluded to this too, is that there's there's not really, and Jay could go on about this. Um, uh, uh, dissent is not really encouraged within parties, and I think there should be a lot more of that. At least mm -hmm. um, discussion that can be dissent. For example, I was really. Um, impressed that Peter Welch came out and was very courageous and was the first U.S. Senator to say that Biden should go. Um, and I can, I can, knowing how politics works, I can only imagine Biden's people, Biden's people called him up and said, you, you know, don't expect FEMA ever to spend a dollar in Vermont again. Um, and, you know, he, he was the first one and I'm glad he did it. And very, very brave. And I think going back to Monique's privacy, data privacy bill, Traditionally in the, in the House, um, the minority party gets one chair. And so there's one Republican chair in the House, this guy called Mike Marcotte. And it was really amazing when that bill was on the floor of the House. Here's the governor's veto message saying this bill should not be passed. This Republican, a conservative Republican from Coventry, got up and said this is a great bill and we should pass it. And that is so rare. That's probably what made me think this is probably the best bill this whole, this whole session, and, it, and then the Senate um, rejects it. But I, I, I would love to see more problem solving, you know, with parties working together and, and, and Democrats um, listening to a lot more dissent. Thanks. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, John, for alluding to the, to the lack of dissent problem in the State House. It really, truly is an issue that Every session, we lawmakers, we convene, and the, almost the bulk of the policies that we have created uh, a list of priorities around. And those priorities, by, to be candid, are created by very few people. Um, these policies are crafted by special interests. And so the, almost the entirety of the public policy process is, is scripted. It's, um, it's theater. At, and it's not very good theater. It's, um, uh, it's a highly performative job, and we're all doing a poor job of, of performing it. So I think the thing that I try to do uh, right now is acknowledge to the public how true that is, how much the legislature itself has failed uh, on a lot of issues. And um, what am I going to do to create comedy or, or preserve it, I think I'm going to try and, and, and encourage new members to understand what it looks like to be uh, authentic and to express themselves honestly uh, throughout the day and, you know, in the State House and at home. Um, there's a lot of fake smiles. There's a lot of un misplaced thank yous. Um, and I think that we have to be able to get to the heart of the matter on the issues and uh, actually talk about what it is that is the problem as opposed to avoiding the elephant in the room, if you will. Thanks. Jim? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thinking about this, one of my mentors in this process is a guy named Jonathan Brownell who used to live in Corinth. Um, now I think he's working in Europe. But um, one of his messages a long time ago, which holds true today, is it's not government's job to solve everybody's problem. It is government's job to convene a forum through which people with intractable differences can work together to solve problems together. Um, and comedy for me very much is, is practicing that, that sentiment. It's our job to convene 
people of different opinions, different, sometimes wildly different opinions, to work through intractable differences to try to find ways towards a solution. And it's that process that is where comedy should exist and where we need to practice it every day when we're in the state house. And um, some of us are more outspoken than others, some of it less so, but it's really our, our job to work through differences quietly in committee, um, in the cafeteria, in the halls, or on the floor where we make our speeches to see if we can find ways, find the appropriate language that allows us to bridge the gap among different opinions so that we can come up with better solutions that we all agree with. Thank you. Cool. Carl? Um, I, think, I think my colleagues have covered what happens in the State House here pretty, pretty well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the campaign trail instead. Um, I, you know, my, my approach to this on the campaign trail has always been to talk about what my values are and what I want to get done in Montpelier. And when I knock on doors, I'm basically there to listen to people. And if it means that I've got to stand there for five minutes and get yelled at, then so be it. And I think um, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman said that um, Bernie said it's okay to be angry and it's okay to be angry and people have good reasons for being angry oftentimes. Sometimes they uh, just need to be heard and um, that is uh, worth a lot to a lot of folks and I think it's similar to what Monique said about um, being responsive to constituents. But um, you know when I'm, when I'm on the campaign trail this, later on this summer and fall I'm going to be listening to what people have to say and um, not spending a lot of time talking unless it's to say what I want to do uh, and what I want to get done um, on a, in a third term in Montpelier. Good advice. Monique. Yeah. Um, so the, after the first year, um, I went home uh, after it just felt really just bad last year at the, end, at the end of things. I went home and I binged a bunch of like conflict resolution, hostage negotiation books, like all of that. Um, and, and going into this year, uh, I just <laughs> uh, had an appreciation, an even more upper of appreciation for the difficult conversations as everybody said. So, um, and, and what, uh, what I learned this year, because I was clerk, so I was on the leadership team of the Rural Caucus, um, and that is, um, that's tripartisan, so it's a Dem uh, leader, a independent leader, and a um, Demo yeah, Democratic, Republican, and independent leader. And then I'm on there taking notes. <laughs> um, and they had really hard conversations. And one of my like, best mentors in the building was Laura Sebelia, who's an independent. Um, and, uh, and then on the data privacy bill, we had progressives, we had a libertarian, we had a Demo Democrats, and then we had a, a, a Republican chair. Um, and again, really hard conversations. And it just working with those uh, two groups in particular just made me really value uh, not only how like they're showing up to a conversation, but how I'm showing up to a conversation um, and being able to think through respectfully what they need to be cautious of and where our lines are and where our values are and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the building itself, um, and I know we're all, we're all Dems here, but it, it felt like there could be conversations if people were willing to have them. And in our Democratic Party in particular, it seemed like in some ways we weren't willing to have hard conversations. Rebecca, Jay knows this, like we were all on different uh, pushing in our own respects uh, against just not uh, pushing things through without stopping and fighting if we need to. Getting in a room and just yelling at each other <laughs> if that's what we need to do. So I just, uh, going back, like, I want to keep trying to, to push that, whether it's in the building or outside the building, in conversations with people, um, that we have to be willing to talk, otherwise we can't do anything. Thanks. Marco. The uh, expression we started out with today was the Ed Funding System is in Crisis. The uh, Ed Funding System that took eight years to put together with people of goodwill working on a solution. Um, what has changed since that, that system replaced three Ed formulas in six years, and it's lasted 20-some. This has been a tough year on education. 
But what has made it difficult is because the incomes that become unequal over 24 years are straining that system. And we are less in it altogether than we were 24 years ago. And trying to resolve that is difficult. Um, the Senate um, has been rem remarkable, in my view, on the number of times they have voted unanimously for things like the teacher's retirement, fixing the teacher's retirement system that doesn't go as bankrupt. 30 nothing. Governor has vetoed budgets, and they've been overridden. 30 to nothing. The Senate tries to work together, but in a time of growing income equality, the strains are tougher. And we have to listen to our constituents. To going door to door is a listening experience, and you can hear it. You can hear their frustration as the world changes under the current legislation. And we need to move in it and deal with that. Thank you. So we set as a goal to do this uh, forum this afternoon in an hour and a half instead of the usual two hours. Will any of you feel horribly offended if I don't ask that last question? I'll tell the audience what the question was. <clears throat> Pose yourself a question and answer it that you think that this group would be interested in. So I'm going to let that conversation take place after we conclude. And I want to, let's give them a real, genuine, robust round of applause. <laughs> Rebecca Holcomb. Don, I'd be remiss if I didn't make sure that our last comment was that we have a huge transition at the federal level. Every one of us has a job right now. Our job is to talk up our Democratic presidential candidate, whoever it is. You need to get behind them. You need to talk positively about them in your neighborhood because we can't afford to have the Democrat lose. That's all of our job. Every one of us needs to do that. So please, please help reach out to your neighbors, reach out to your friends. Anyone else have a closing statement? <laughs> Jim. This is going a little bit of a different direction, but um, there was an opinion piece in Digger two days ago, I think, and the title was The Myth of Sustainable Development. I don't know how people saw that. Um, it certainly goes in a different direction from what we usually talk about here, but, but the point, the underlying point is, is even as, as careful as we are in Vermont with sustainable development. Um, if we look at what we're really doing to our landscape, we're whittling it away little by little by little, and we need to find a better approach to how we do that or we will not survive. Thank you. Thank you so much, audience, for coming on this gorgeous afternoon and engaging with these really good public servants. Thanks. Thank you, Bill.